to write the book, but why don't I start with um, reading, and, I, and since this is Concord, I really have to read one of the passages that is in Concord. So I was going to read um, the section where, this is after Lydian and Ralph Waldo Emerson were married in Plymouth in her parlor of her family home. And um, they're going, um, it's her, she's been to Concord before, but she's never seen the house, and that was the tradition at the time. The bride was not supposed to see the house before she was married, so this is, and she has a lot, the other background piece you need to know is that she had a lot of ambivalent feelings about moving to Concord. Plymouth was, um, her home had been her home for 33 years, and she, and she was, um, she felt that, con that Concord was kind of a, country backwater town. That's, that was her attitude at the time. And from the perspective of someone in Plymouth, it probably was in, the, in that day. So this is um, just a little short passage about, about that. <coughs> Mr. Emerson and I set out on our journey in mid-morning. Most of my furniture had been sent ahead, packed in two great carts, but we carried my trunk of clothes and a few other personal things in the chaise. Mr. Emerson held my hand as we rode the pressure of, the, of his fingers quickening my palm. We reached Concord late in the afternoon. The sun was low and the air, which had been warm all day, turned cool and crystalline beneath the still blue sky. Tears of saffron light lay across the fields, broken by the long shadows of trees that grew beside the slanting rail fences. We passed an orchard on our right. Red fruit winked brightly among the darkening leaves. Clouds clotted the western horizon their edges silvered by the sun. The trees on the hills were already shrouded in darkness. We passed houses I recognized from my first visit, a small brown hut with a listing chimney, a two-story brick home set well back from the road, the charred posts and beams of a burned barn. Mr. Emerson, who had been telling me of his delight in Montaigne's essays, said we're almost there, and I felt my stomach flutter in a twist of goosey anticipation. We rounded a narrow curve, and the road ahead grew level and straight, running between two wide fields bounded by woodlots. Ahead on the left, I glimpsed a white house between the trees. I pressed the heels of my hands hard into my waist in a vain attempt to quiet my rebellious insides. Mr. Emerson had promised that I would like the house, and I believed him. I felt obliged to believe him, but I was suddenly overwhelmed with doubt. What if he hadn't noticed crooked set windows or overlooked a missing pantry? What if the dining room wasn't large enough to hold my mahogany table, or the bedchamber too small to contain my four-poster? What if the stair balustrades were broken or wobbly? <coughs> Suddenly the trees opened and the house came into full view. Mr. Emerson slowed the horse. We turned beneath a row of horse chestnuts, went through a gate into a grassy yard, and drew up in front of the small portico. He slipped the reins and settled back in his seat. Welcome home, he said. My stomach clamped down hard. My home is in Plymouth, I thought, the words beating in my mind with the fervor of drums, but I did not say it, for at that moment I couldn't speak. I stared at the house at the long white clapboards and twin chimneys. I knew from Mr. Emerson's letter that the building was L-shaped, but from my angle in the buggy seat, it looked like a two-story box. It was neither as elegant nor as large as I'd expected. Beyond the fence to my left lay an unkempt field, and behind the house, the land dipped, then rose again to a low ridge occupied by a large brick home that even at that distance I could see was sadly in need of repair. I caught the bright glint of a stream twisting through the field. A few young birch trees grew at the water's edge. The landscape looked raw and barren, the low hills a drab brown in the dwindling light. You're unnaturally quiet, Mr. Emerson said. I hope you're not disappointed. I managed to find my voice. It's a handsome house. How could I be disappointed? Is the inside plaster and glass still exposed? He laughed and assured me it was not. Um, that's <laughs> just a little bit. Um, all right, and um, I, would, I would like to talk just briefly about how I came to write this book because um, someone actually just said to me, you know, it's a good subject. It hasn't been, nothing much been done with um, Lydia. And I wasn't out looking for a good subject. It was, it came, and some of you know, well, my friends uh, who are here already know this. But it actually started about nine years ago when an email friend of mine who lives in California and loves Emerson and Thoreau and all of the Concord people um, asked me about Lydian, what I knew about Lydian Emerson. And I had never heard the name. I, I was totally ignorant of it. I didn't know anything about it.
powder. So, because he lived in California and, and out in the country didn't have access to a big library, and I lived in Massachusetts, I went to my local library and looked around, and eventually, over, I got in, really kind of interested, gave him information, and we uh, corresponded back and forth. He found what he could on, on Lydian and the Emersons, and we started to sort of back and forth conversation. And uh, eventually, I came to Concord, which is, of course, where you have to come if you want, <laughs> if you want to know about um, any of these transcendentalists in that whole circle. And over uh, the course of, um, and then after, it, must, it was probably a year or more, when he started suggesting, why don't you write a novel? We had collected all this information. And I said, no, <laughs> you know, I have no I didn't at that point have any interest in writing a novel. I'd written uh, fiction and stuff, but it was not what I thought I was interested in. It made more sense to me at that time to write a biography, but I'm not a nonfiction writer, and I haven't. I said, but I did. I did suggest that to my agent. I said, "What would a biography be a good idea?" And she said, "Well, maybe, but you're not really the person to write it. Your your background is in fiction." So, you know, I I continued to kind of resist the idea, but eventually I started writing, just little, like like it might be a little short story. I thought I'd start with a short story, and it just kind of grew, and I became more and more uh, obsessed. And of course, any time uh, a fiction writer's writing gets obsessed with something, it's because it connects with their own, uh, who they are, their personality, their history in some way or another. And there's a number of ways um, in which I connected with, with Lydia and Emerson. Um, simple things like the fact that I have four children and she had four children. Although, thank the Lord, none of mine have died as, as her oldest son died. Um, my husband is not famous like my father Emerson, but he is a public man. He's in the ministry and, and, and public in that way. And so I felt the constraints of living, you know, in a way that, that makes it, you know, not anything I do wouldn't look bad, reflect badly on him and all of that, uh, people's expectations. And there's a minor, I don't think I've told anyone this, but, um, and again, it's not, Lydia, as you may know, if you know the history of Emerson, he had two wives. Lydia was his second wife. And, his, and she was married to him for 47 years, but he had, his first wife was Ellen Louisa Tucker from uh, New Hampshire, and she, he, he was married to her for about 18 months and she, when she died of tuberculosis at the age of 19. And my husband, uh, his girlfriend prior to meeting me, um, who he was quite deeply in love with, died at the age of 19 during, while, while we were, they had already broken up, but anyways. Now, my husband, I will assure you, did not, is not still holding the torch for his girlfriend, but, but nonetheless, there was that little piece, just a little, just enough of a little link to kind of make it another intriguing thing for me and got to kind of get into that. So, um, it, in the course of this process, I don't want you to think that I sat and eight hours a day researched Lydia and Emerson for nine years, because I certainly didn't. One of the things I did was to go... Um, to Vermont College and get my master's at MFA in creative writing. And when I went there, um, they have a low residency program where you where you um, are on campus for four, well, two, at the end of every semester, you're on campus for two weeks and very intensive um, workshop programs. And then the rest of the time, you do your work with an advisor um, through the mail and you get your work critiqued and you send, you send in packets every few weeks. And my advisor for my second semester was Brett Lott, who's the author who wrote Jewel and a song I know by heart, knew by heart, I guess. Um, and he, when he first, uh, I got him as an advisor, his advice, his advice the first day was, well, you, I had already come to the program with a full draft of this book. And he said, well, you put, what you should do is put it in a drawer, don't look at it, and start again. So after taking a deep breath and kind of pulling my, at my hair a little bit, I actually did that. And it was very good advice. It was excellent advice. So this book is not the same book. But I, I did many, many things in the process of trying to find my story. Because this is, this is fiction. And um, I think that a fiction writer can approach a kind of truth um, that a biographer cannot. But a biographer, but, but the facts, you know, it's truth maybe with a capital T, truth truths about lives that are relevant to us. But I would not want anyone to take this book and think that it's a biography of Lady Emerson, although many of the things uh, did happen, and it's based in, it's certainly based in fact. Um, and I think many of the things that I speculate about could have happened, but I have no, you know, there's no proof of, of that. Um, so uh, 
Well, we're, I, one of my problems is I get going on too many things and I could uh, unfortunately talk about living in for hours and we don't have that much time. But um, I'll, I'll open it to questions if you, if you have any. And um, I, I drew very heavily on Ellen Emerson's biography of her mother. Um, and then that led, and then I also <coughs> checked it out. I mean, I did a lot of, one, one of the things I found is that you can't just read about one of these people here, these conquered, mm -hmm. this conquered group. You, they lead you immediately to the others. And so I, I read uh, biographies of Emerson and Thoreau and certainly the Alcott and all, all those, that whole circle. And I, there's still stuff I would love. I keep, I'm still bumping into things like, I wish the Peabody Sisters book had come out before. I, well, I mean, you know, that would be wonderful. Um, but one of the things, because that I, I did kind of over research, I think, um, because it it made it difficult for me to figure out what I would want to use and what I wouldn't. A lot of there's wonderful, wonderful stories that Emerson, uh, that Ellen Emerson tells about her mother's childhood that I had in some early drafts, but it would have made the book 800 pages, I think, you know, if I were to include all of that. So a good, a good, a good piece of it. If you have read the book, I could, you know, tell you. you. <laughs> like, the letter of that letter that appears fairly early, the proposal letter um, that Ralph Waldo Emerson sends to Lydian is the actual letter, yeah. and I did get permission to, to well. print that. There's tons of letters. Mm -hmm. they all much yes, and I think his um, journal, the the collection of his journal that Joel Port wrote, um, published is. Is wonderful, and I that was a great resource because once I got a sense of who Lydian was, I was able to read that journal and find places where he's made sort of general statements. I don't like people that are sick or people that scream every time the window falls, you know, things like that. And and you wouldn't know what he's talking about unless you understand. He's talking about Lydian. I mean, that's what he's bouncing off of. And, it's, and it also was made it pretty clear then that within a couple of years. Um, into this marriage, two or three years, he was starting to write negative statements about marriage. Um, and I think, again, that's when he was coming off his own. That marriage was having problems fairly early. Pardon? Are those in the letters, those things? Or where would you go? It's through? more in his journals. Yeah. Joel Port's selected yeah. journal. Okay. That's, yeah. I, I recommend that. Yeah. And it's not to say that they didn't have their good times. One little thing, but they did. I mean, obviously, the, one of the things that I found, little things, I love these little things. <laughs> it, and people, when you read biographies of Emerson, it talks about, it refers to Lydian, it talks about him calling her Queenie, which gives you a certain image of her. And I, I think it probably, scored, you know, I'm sure he did call her Queenie, I'm not questioning that. Um, but I did find out in reading his letters, or actually it's um, Ellen, at Tucker, his first wife's letters, that he also called her Queenie, too. And she was like eight years younger. So he was very fond of taking, it was just interesting that he used the same nickname. Um, and, I'm not, and I don't think of Ellen, I don't think Ellen Tucker was queenly in the way that Lydian was in terms of her I think sort of uh, Emerson told his brother, uh, William, that, uh, the, sec that the, uh, the second marriage, that it was a sober joy. Yes, he did. He, he he was quite clearly trying to make it a very different sort of man. Yeah, it was. But would you say, what percentage of the book is really in your imagination? Because is, is it true in the book you said you thought Thoreau was the father of one of the children? That, I do not believe that. But, but is that in the book? The book the, 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 is in the book. She wrestles with the book. She worries. It's a guilt thing for her. She thinks that maybe I think that the whole, th I mean, I don't want to spoil the book for people that have it, but I think um, that was one of the things I had to wrestle with, and my advisors encouraged me to let the character go, but that's where I think Lydian, the person, um, is, it, in that case, I think it's Lydian, the character, um, that, that had to go with the, the extra, emotionally. We know, we know, I mean, there's evidence, I think, that Thoreau had an infatuation with Lydia and Emerson. I don't know how long it lasted. Um, but we really don't have any information of what she felt. So I had to imagine that in return. Any other questions? Any other questions? <laughs>
other questions. Strange yeah. one. What's the background of the illustration on the cover, which I found very gripping? It's a good illustration. No, I have nothing. I can't claim anything. I don't have anything to do with that. That's the book design department of St. Martin. Yeah. <coughs> it is from a period yeah. photograph. I think it's a photo. It's not. It's not Lydia. Right. No. Clearly. But, yeah. Well, I was asking Amy, but, uh, what, there were some words in the, it that I had come across, and uh, I was curious as to what they were. She uses uh, dancing stocks. She talks about dancing stock in the beginning chapter, and what she was encouraging Sylvia, her niece, to Sophia, yeah. Sophia, excuse me, um, to to stand in her dancing stock for periods of time. And I asked Amy what they were, and well, <laughs> yeah, this was this was I don't know when it. I asked about a person uh, who does ballet, who did ballet um, for the Boston Ballet, that, about these, and she never heard of them. So they're obviously not happening. But this is something Lydian did as a self-discipline when she was growing up, and it was a block of wood with feet uh, openings for your feet that were at one eight degree, how many degrees, and you would stand in them. And she, had, which was, I'm sure, very painful. <laughs> but she stood in the her, her dancing master told her that the longer she stood in them, the better, the better dancer she would be. This was that way. But she was, she was, by all reports, a very graceful woman, um, and moved gracefully. And was attractive on that level. Question: What, um, around what year would she have been learning dancing in the 18? Well, she was born in, and 30s? She was born in 1802. So probably in her early teens. Yeah, I could speak a little be. bit about that in terms of the history of dance. This wouldn't yeah. have been you know, ballet as we know it, but it was a very interesting transition period from the more formal group dances that actually emulated the early ballet steps to the more sort of casual, you know, almost what then grew into square dancing, which was more of a walking dance. But they still held a number of the, you know, the, the truly trained steps that the French aristocracy were learning, which kept them completely separate from the peasants because it took you, you know, yeah. seven or eight years to develop the physique to actually do it. So there still was that um, formality and intense training in the, in the early period of dancing up to around 1850 or so, when there are comments, uh, you know, people writing, oh, dancing isn't what it used to be in my childhood, you right. know, everybody's sloppy and so forth. Well, she was, she was, as I said, known as a graceful person. She did, there are references to after Emerson's death, her going to a ball and dancing. Um, she seems to have come out of her shell a little bit after he died, which I find very interesting because she was in her 80s at that point. But, you know. <laughs> yes. What kind of process did you go through developing her voice in the book? And how much I, you know, I, I, it's, it was one of those kind of bizarre things that seemed to come. Not instantly. I mean, I've been reading about her, reading letters, reading journals for a long time, for maybe a couple of two or three years before I really started it. And once I started writing in her voice, it seemed to just kind of flow. So it was, I, I don't want to get spooky here, you know, I don't want, <laughs> don't want you to say I challenge Lydian, but you know, I, but it almost felt that way. And I, one of the things I did, um, I think I did almost two or three years worth of creating her journal for her, which as far as I know, if she ever wrote a journal, I have no information that she did. I don't know if she wrote one and it was burned, or I found it int odd that she didn't because so many of the people in that circle, including the women, did write journals. But anyways, there's no reference that anything I could find. Um, so I thought, well, I'll do it. One of my, one of the incarnations of this book was going to be this long, long journal, uh, which my agent wasn't too <laughs> thrilled with. <laughs> so, um, that could which, be the sequel. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think maybe. Uh, there's a lot I took out of this book. Um, to make it really just marketable because of the size, and I would there was a whole because I went on um, considerably in, in uh, well if you haven't read the whole book it's not, <laughs> come back and talk later or something but um, there that I that I would have liked to keep but you know I mean I think it, it works as it is but it's one of those decisions that it, you make compromises in order that people will be able to read it. Um, but the journal, I think doing that journal probably helped me a lot because it kind of went through. And one of the things that helped me, why I was, one of the reasons I was doing it was also that I could get the sequence of things and when they happened and how that would be. And, um, but one of, one of 
there was actually quite a lot of information. When I first started this process, I thought there was very little out there about Lydian, um, and that was one of the things that drove me. Um, was like, why, why don't we know about this woman who was married to him for 47 years? And there were two books that published, uh, in, I don't know, 50s or 60s or something. Two books on Ellen Tucker Emerson, who she, he was married to for 18, 18 uh, months. No, 18, yeah, 18 months. And um, so, so I got very um, curious about that. There, but there's a fair amount, and especially if you start reading in from, you know, the letters and the biographies of Emerson. But for the most part, she's been a pretty shadowy figure until um, Dolores Brick Carpenter did her research on, on uh, the little biography that Ellen wrote and was not published until she did it for her dissertation in the 1980s. So there wasn't a lot out there about, about Lydian. Um, what was I going to say? I don't know. <laughs> so I was going somewhere with this. That's what I was saying. Um, yeah. Can you tell a little bit about the chapters? I noticed that you have them individualized. You mean, the, the, the friendship is one chapter. That was just, you know, I just got so much into that whole Ment it, it mentally, for me, it, it felt like I wanted to, I got into that, the whole business of the little epigraphs. Yes. It's not necessary to read the book, but I just felt like there was a pattern there. I, yeah. I can't really, I don't know. I don't really have a great answer. I don't think so. no. See, I don't know. I mean, that, it gets so tricky because these Whatever. are real people. And when did that know, stop Hollywood? <laughs> you know, that's true. You know, I was talking with somebody who was like, well, who would play Emerson? You know. Oh. So, anyways, but I mean, you know, I don't know. I, no, I didn't think. It, I didn't think of no, that. Think it's like, yes. How did Emerson and Lydia first come in contact with each other? That's a good did someone introduce them, or? That's one of the things we really don't know. We really don't know much about about their early relationship. Um, she apparently. One of the problems is you get different, different biographies will tell you different things. So she apparently um, did hear him preach, and he was a rising star kind of in the, in the 1830s. She heard him preach in Boston and was impressed. But most people seem to have been impressed with him. He's not the kind of orator that I think would knock our socks off. But he had a, he, no, I mean, really, he had a presence. I think this man um, had an extraordinary presence. He didn't, he didn't speak loudly. He didn't even gesture very much, but he seemed to be able to hold audiences in the palm of his hand. Um, and, and she heard him, but he came to Plymouth, um, where she lived, um, shortly, uh, just after visiting, I think it was probably at the invitation of his friend, who uh, was called the college I'm going to get the name wrong, George Bancroft, I think, who was... Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, George Bancroft, who was, I think, a college roommate of his and, and worked in Plymouth, and he also taught um, Lydian. Uh, she was one of his philosophy students. And she, um, he came, and so I suspect he was somewhat involved. But that's my invention. I don't have that. Uh, I don't have any documentation for that. But he had been visiting his brother on Staten Island, who had just had his first child. And I think. Emerson, my own feeling is Emerson had decided at that point that he was going, if he was going to move along um, his life, he wanted to be a, a family, he wanted to have a family, and he, and having seen his brother, his nephew, kind of prompted, you know, he was about that age when men start to think seriously of settling down. He had, uh, he probably realized by then he was never going to get over Alan Tucker, but he was going to move on anyways. And they seem to have met. He did. He did lecture there a few times, and he seems to have met her um, and connected with her at this reception, which I do. Invent. I mean, there there was a real reception. I do recreate it. I don't know any of the details of the reception I made, except that where it was, that was in the home, um, and and connected with her. But she claimed um, that she that it was a total shock to her that he proposed. And he did propose by letter, just as it's reflected here. Um, I don't, and that she had no intention, particularly, of getting married. She was, as I said, in her early 30s, and was seemed to claim that she was very happy being a single woman. And she was the um, aunt. Uh, she had two uh, nephew and niece. And, um, so it's it's an interesting thing. My own take on this, and this is a part. Of, it's a thread that runs through this book. She, that she was a very religious woman, and she was also living in a time when religion was, um, 
it was just in the air. I mean, it was every, the Emerson and that whole group were the, sort of the beginning of the, of the breaking away of having everybody uh, believe in the same kind of religion. And so, so um, she, but I believe she thought for whatever reasons that that was what God wanted her to do. So anyway, so that's my take. Any other questions? Yeah. How much um, help is it in writing to go through a, a master's program of creative writing? Does that do you feel like you could have done it without that? Or it been oh, yeah. I mean, I w I'd already, I mean, I think I improved things, but I, I actually entered the program so I could be qualified to teach. And then you'll have to ask me why I'm not teaching. <laughs> I don't really, you know, maybe that's the next thing. But, well, it was interesting. You get halfway through the program and they said, well, to really teach, you have to publish. <laughs> so, <laughs> one of those. Two. I, I think it was it was it was probably helpful, but you certainly at least the, you shouldn't assume that it's your ticket to publication. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I enjoy I enjoyed it very much, and I said I think the book is better for it. Amy, could you just comment on Emerson's changing her name because you had a slightly different take on that from what I had read somewhere else. So. Well, there's it's all it's out there that he changed her name, yeah. and I think that that's one of the um, her name was Lydia Jackson, that was her name, and that he changed her name. And there's all kinds of the, the I think the standard, the most common was that he changed her name because he he knew that Lydia when you combine it with Emerson would sound like Lydia Emerson in New England Miles. And I don't know who came up with that. I don't know if he, he may have really said that. I don't know. He also had a good sense of humor. He may have been quipping. I don't really um, know why he changed it. But the thing I object to that it's sometimes been presented is that she just kind of was a doormat type of person and just let him, you know, do whatever he wanted to her name. And I don't believe that. And the, the reason I don't believe it is because she was known in Plymouth, um, and if you go to Plymouth and visit her home, which is now the Mayflower Society building, um, the guys will tell you <laughs> are very clear about that. She was and she was a combative person. She was a good debater. She was a very brilliant woman. Um, she wasn't the kind of person. She was the only person in the family, in the Emerson family, who would take on Mary Moody Emerson, and nobody else wanted to. It was just too <laughs> scary, and, it, and she so. You know, I don't think she had the kind of personality to just roll over. Um, and the other thing is that I found it very interesting because we know that he begged her, essentially, to call him Waldo on several occasions. And she, all her life, all her married life, she referred to him both in public and in private as Mr. Emerson. So that tells you that, you know, it's not a matter of rolling over. It's a matter of she's, I think probably she liked the name. There are music, of course, Lydian, um, has musical connotations in terms of a certain kind of harmony in it. But I, that's, is that, does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, okay. Anything else? Do you have another passage that, or a short Would you passage? like me to read? I'm going to read, I love the part with, sure. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> sure I can read it. Um, because Mary Moody Emerson makes such a great character. <laughs> she was so much fun to work with, and I don't know, she might be too much to try to, try to, try to take on as a major character, but she's so eccentric. I, but, but I don't, but Emerson, as you may know, Phyllis Cole's work really pointed this out. Yeah, Emerson drew very heavily on his aunt's work. Another brilliant woman, eccentric, and the story is that she ran around wearing her shroud, which in fact was not really her shroud. Apparently it was a, a Millerite costume that she adopted, but she was one of those strong-minded people that did what she wanted. But she didn't make life easy for Lydian, <laughs> at least initially. And this whole family that Lydian was coming into, this was after the uh, engagement, but before they were married, this passage. The whole, it was really still very much, the whole family, not just Emerson, was still in love with Ellen Tucker, and who was a lovely, young, sweet, bright, uh, very talented young woman who died tragically of tuberculosis. And, and I don't want to minimize that. I mean, it was tragic. Um, but. Again, yeah, Mary Moody didn't make it easy. This is um, her first meeting with Mary Moody Emerson, Lydian's first meeting. And she's been convinced by Mr. Emerson that um, she needs to invite Mary Moody to visit. Now, Mary Moody was um, a huge influence on Ralph Waldo Emerson's 
um, life. He, when his father died when he was eight, she was the person who moved into the family to help out. And she was really responsible for encouraging him to go to Harvard and all of that. So one of those people that had. And there's another connection for me because, although it's on the other side, but um, my father had, a, had, a, had an aunt that was very much like that character in his own life. So anyway. Um, so this is when she's um, meeting Mary Moody for the first time, who's coming to visit her. I stood at the window watching Miss Emerson light from her carriage. She was the smallest woman I'd ever seen, as small as a child. And the way she darted up the walk to the door made me think of an excited bird. She held her head high, and her blunt nose so resembled a beak that I had to suppress a laugh. The bird image remained with me even after she crossed the threshold for Miss Emerson seemed to flutter and flap about in her worn cape until I, until I relieved her of it. Her cap was too small to contain her hair, or perhaps her hair was as wiry as her wit and refused to be constrained by a fragment of linen. I'm poverty struck, she chirped, else I would have brought you a gift. But if Waldo tells me true, then you'll cherish no gift more than a vigorous conversation, which I mean to grant you. She smiled up at me, her eyes shiny as black beads in her lively face. I detected a mischievous note in her voice and was surprised by her uncommon candor and high sense of humor, a combination of qualities that first charmed and later embarrassed me. In the parlor, she perched on the lip of her chair, her eyes dancing across, her hands dancing across the black froth of her skirt, shoulders twitching, eyes blinking, gray wisps of hair escaping her cap. She spoke quickly, the words rushing from her, as if there were not time enough left in the world to say all that needed to be said. I found it difficult to keep up with her sudden shifts in the subject. It was not really a conversation at all, but a combination of interrogation and sermon. One moment she was lecturing me on the necessity for wives to zealously advance moral reform and the abolition of slavery, and the next she was asking me my thoughts on the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.